All right, so welcome to the second uh, lecture for 12Y, um, Data Visualization and Social Sciences. Uh, what we're going to focus on today is how to make impactful graphs. So we're going to keep building on um, the skills that you're learning through the triads in terms of um, manipulating and presenting data. And we're going to focus on some of the um, kind of visual and aesthetic rules for trying to direct viewers' attention um, to the comparisons that we want to make and how can we make those um, comparisons as clear and impactful as possible. And so we're going to cover four main topics in this lecture. Um, first, how can we um, have clear and accurate scales of comparison for our visualizations? Second, how can we use um, color in an effective and not distracting way? Um, third, how can we know when we're making a part-to-whole comparison versus uh, a comparison across different kinds of levels of a predictor and an outcome variable? Uh, and then third, what are some different um, other considerations to make for how we can direct our viewers' attention when we're using a visualization like a graph um, or when we're using a visualization like a table? Uh, so. The example that we'll use um, for trying to think through the best ways to visualize something and the bad ways to visualize something um, is that we're going to analyze some data about crime rates in the United States over the course of time. And a data visualization um, would be really helpful for this kind of a topic um, because there's a lot of kind of perceptions around crime as something that increases um, kind of alarmingly over the course of time. Um, and that appears in the news, it appears in public statements from um, politicians and police chiefs, and it's a common public sentiment that this is happening. Um, but with something so important, we want to use the best data that we have to create the most accurate picture possible um, for what's going on with something like crime. And so there's been a lot of news headlines over the last few years uh, about crime rising in big cities, particularly places like DC, um, Chicago, New York. Um, the police chiefs of those cities um, make statements about um, crime increasing and about this being a problem, which get picked up um, by high profile outlets like the New York Times and the Washington Post. Um, and then politicians um, kind of campaign on a platform of um, crime being an increasing and alarming trend uh, and something that they will work to stop. And so when we got as much kind of public attention um, to this message that there's been um, growing crime and that um, any growth in crime is very alarming, it's not at all surprising that most people in the United States think that crime is growing. Um, and so in a a nationally representative um, poll. So uh, Gallup, what they do is they contact several thousand um, adults in the United States through telephone lines, the internet, um, and a variety of um, kind of in-person channels as well. And they ask them questions. They're trying to get a sample of respondents in the U.S. that represent the national population. And so it's like a, a slice of the whole population that we want to study. And we hope that that slice gives us information about what that whole population thinks or does. And in their samples, they find pretty consistently over the course of time, and in the most recent one being 2014, that the majority of Americans, uh, and in this case, 63%, um, when they're asked, do you think crime has increased this year relative to last year, they say yes. Uh, and then when we've got other kinds of data visualizations in places like the New York Times, this message about um, alarming increases in crime um, come through really powerfully as well. And so this is a data visualization um, that the New York Times put together uh, comparing homicide rates in 2015 um, to the kind of average from the previous few years across a bunch of different cities. And so what they're trying to convey is the places that have had the largest growth in homicide rates over the, the past few years. And so they've got a map of the United States and they're labeling um, the map with the different cities that they're visualizing and the red arrow, the length of that red arrow, the height of it, um, portrays the uh, extent to which the homicide rate has increased over the course of the last few years. Uh, and so some of these arrows are enormous. Um, so you've got Baltimore with this gigantic arrow, um, St. Louis, Las Vegas, um, and to a lesser extent, places like Cleveland and Milwaukee um, all have kind of large uh, red arrows. Uh, even my hometown of Indianapolis right here um, has this red arrow that portraying an increase in the homicide rate. Um, and so what this visualization does is it communicates um, to some extent 
uh, how much crime differs in terms of its increase from one city to the next. Um, but there's also a lot of information that this visualization doesn't necessarily convey. And so we're seeing a bunch of different cities, but there are tons of cities in the United States. Why are we only seeing these ones? And all of the cities that we see have this um, kind of red arrow going upward, indicating increasing homicide. And so it looks like homicide is just kind of increasing in this tidal wave across the entire United States. Um, everyone's getting murdered. No one should leave their house because there's just um, such a rapid and alarming growth of um, homicide rates. But are there cities where um, the homicide rate hasn't been increasing that much? And um, do we have a context for thinking about what this scale is? So um, this increase of, um, you know, plus 20 is it, the length of that arrow makes it look like it's just a, a, an astronomical um, skyrocket in the homicide rate. Um, but what's a longer kind of historical context for thinking about um, what that scale might really mean? Uh, another visualization from the New York Times. Uh, and so here, instead of the increase, they're giving us more information. They're giving us both um, an increase calculated as a percent change and um, the actual numbers of murders in those given years. Uh, and so in Milwaukee, which has uh, the largest kind of percent change increase from 2014 to 15, we see that there were 59 murders in Milwaukee in 2014, and then there was 105 murders in Milwaukee in 2015. Uh, and then the percent change, which is also visualized by the length of this bar here. Remember um, from the triad exercise, you're just taking um, the difference. Uh, so this number in 2015 minus this number in 2014, um, which was an increase of uh, 45 murders. And then you're dividing that by um, the total kind of amount in 2014, the previous year. And so that increase of 45 murders over how many there were in that that base year of 59, that's 76 percent. Uh, and so we're seeing here just um, what they call a sampling of cities where the number of murders this so far this year is outpacing um, the same period last year. And so we're seeing Milwaukee with this enormous percent change. Um, but the percent change is much bigger in part just because the number of murders in Milwaukee in 2014 was smaller. So the increase um, in Baltimore from one year to the next was a lot bigger. So it went from 138 murders to 215. So that's an increase of 77 murders. Um, but because the base um, number was so much larger in 2014 in Baltimore than in Milwaukee, the percent change is smaller. And so percent change is giving us um, kind of a relative growth, um, but that doesn't necessarily um, compare quite so easily across cities when they've got very different kind of base levels of murders. And these cities have very different populations. So of all the cities on this list, like New York is by far the largest. Um, so the city of New York itself has 8 million people in it um, compared to a place like Milwaukee, which has in the whole kind of metropolitan area um, somewhere in the neighborhood of like a million or less. And so we're getting a, a fair bit of information here because they're giving us both the numbers and percent changes. Um, but there's also information that we're not seeing. So we're also not seeing um, that these cities are of different sizes. And they're only showing us cities where the number of murders increased. Um, and so again, we're not seeing the bigger picture. We're not seeing the historical context. And so um, let's try to look at that. So let's uh, address two questions with today's lecture. Uh, first, let's um, try to understand in a broader historical context and for the US as a whole. So not just for particular cities where crime is increasing, how much is it increasing? Um, but for the US as a whole, um, for a longer period of time than just the last few years, has crime really increased? Is this a long-term trend? And then second, let's think more specifically about the kinds of crime that we're interested in. Um, we're really concerned about violent crime. I mean, we're concerned about all crime, but we're probably more concerned about violent crime um, than non-violent crime. So did violent crime increase over time? And so let's walk through a progression of how to visualize um, data in a way that will address these questions. And the data that we'll use come from um, the FBI Uniform Crime Reporting Statistics. Uh, and so if you go online um, to the FBI uh, UCR website, then you can go in and you can choose uh, what states or, or level of the data you want um, to collect crime rates for. And I selected the United States as a whole. 
Um, and then you can choose one or more variable groups. And what they're providing to you is the number of violent crimes, number of property crimes, um, or violent crime rates, property crime rates. And we'll see in a second. The rate means that we're adjusting for the amount of population. And then what range of years do you want the data for? And so I picked through the most recently published um, available data from the UCR website. All right, so when we download these FBI data, um, they're getting this from local um, police precincts. So police precincts are compiling their police reports on all of the crimes by type um, every given year. And then the FBI is collecting these data and assembling them um, into a, a unified source from all of the different local precincts. It's not 100% coverage. Um, the, the vast majority of precincts report their crime data to the FBI, but they don't get everything. Um, there's no perfect source of data on crime in the United States. Also keep in mind that these data are only capturing crimes for which there was a police report, which means that a lot of crimes that are not reported to the police, um, or all crimes that are not reported to the police, are not observed in the data. So there are strengths and weaknesses, um, but in terms of thinking about um, the most kind of comprehensive possible data source for crime rates in the United States, um, the FBI Uniform Crime Reporting Statistics are it. So all right, I go online, um, I input the kind of data that I'd like to download, and then it gives me an Excel spreadsheet that looks something like this. Uh, notice that unlike some of our other data that we've worked with thus far, um, that start with um, the kind of uh, variable titles in the top row, um, there's a header here. And so they're telling me what the kind of source of the data is and where it came from. Um, and then they're describing the contents of the data as well. So this is estimated crime in the United States. Um, the United States is a total, not, not any particular state individually. Um, and then it's telling me over here, national or state crime broken out by violence. So everything um, to the left before you get to property, all of these are different kinds of violent crime. So um, murder and manslaughter, um, rape, robbery, aggravated assault. And then over here, I've got property crimes. Um, and so property crimes are just kind of what we consider nonviolent. Um, it's burglary, um, theft, uh, motor vehicle theft, etc. And so my columns are the variables. And one other thing to notice is that before it starts breaking out into the types of crimes, we just got the total crime. And that's the number of crimes reported. And then we've got the total crime rate. And that's where we take um, the total number of crimes and we um, adjust it, we take the ratio to the population of the United States. And it's actually on the number of crimes per 100,000 people. Um, that's just the way that um, crime rates get reported. And so that's adjusting for the fact that when you look down these columns, um, the population of the United States has grown over the course of time. So the population of the US um, in uh, 1960 was around 179, 180 million, uh, but the population of the U.S. in more recent years is about 330 to 340 million. Um, so the size of the U.S. population has grown a lot. That creates a lot more opportunity for potential crime. Uh, and then each of these rows is just the United States in a given year. So this is all of the data for the United States in 1960, for 1961, yada, 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 yada. All right, so I want to use these data and pull out um, meaningful patterns that address these questions about trends in crime and trends in violent crime. Uh, but looking at this table, it's just really hard to pull out any kind of meaningful story um, without trying to squint your eyes and look really closely. Um, and that's just not the most effective way to convey the information. And so the reason that we're going to create a visualization is that our brains are better disposed to processing visual information um, graphically than they are toward kind of rooting through text-based information. Um, and so even when it's kind of arranged in um, a visual pattern, like a table, there, it's still text-based information. Our brains are still kind of going through that um, additional step of looking through um, a set of numbers, trying to um, do the mental calculation of what that number means in terms of an amount, and then compare the sizes of those numbers from one to the other. But visually, we're able to intuitively understand when like the one column of a column chart is twice as high as the, another column on a column chart. Uh, and so our brains are able to visually process that much more intuitively and quickly 
than if we're using numbers or text-based informations. Uh, and so when we've got a graph, we're able to portray an entire pattern coming out of a data set in a much more kind of concise and intuitive fashion that helps our brain um, quickly focus in on the comparisons that we want to make. And it allows us to remember what those patterns are like um, in kind of a more holistic way. So I can more easily remember, yeah, I've got those three columns in a column chart, that one was twice as high as the other two, than I am to think, okay, in that table, there were three numbers, and I have to think about what the sizes of those numbers were, and then I have to do another mental calculation to think that number was twice the size of the other two numbers. Um, a visual presentation of that information is much more intuitive and much easier to remember. Um, so let's think about a particular example. Here we've got data on sales revenue um, for some company, and the sales revenue is broken out um, in two ways. One is by the source of the revenue. So was it um, domestic sales or international sales? So domestic in the United States, international outside of the United States, and then by month. And what we want to pull out is, um, was there any meaningful trend in the um, sales revenue for these different kinds of sources? And so if I want to understand if there's in any kind of real trend, I'd have to look across the rows here and kind of look through each of these numbers and then try to keep in mind what the previous number was compared to this number and then do the mental calculation for trying to understand when they're getting higher and lower. And so if I look through here, I see increase in February, increase from March to February, but then a decrease from April to March, but then an increase from May to April, and then an increase from June, yada, 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 yada. Um, when I compare the end December to January, that's a lot higher, um, but it also seems like it's going up and down. Um, and I'm just really having to kind of get into this spreadsheet and look at every single number, um, trying to understand what this long-term trend would be. For the international sales, I'm looking across, um, it looks like, okay, bigger, bigger, smaller, bigger, bigger, smaller. Uh, August, whoa, um, I'm having to read through all of these numbers now before I get to August and something's crazy is happening there. Um, and then uh, it looks like this is getting back to what it was. Um, it's just, it's not an intuitive way to convey information. Let's produce a chart. So now we've just got a line chart where on the x-axis down here at the bottom, we've got all of the different months. On the y-axis up here, we've got the amount of sales revenue. And then in the legend, we're signaling um, the sales revenue from the domestic source, the sales revenue from the international source. And now it's much easier to clearly see that in the domestic um, source of revenue, there is kind of a cyclical pattern. There is a bit of an up and down, but the long-term trend is clearly an increase. And the international sales, um, it's much more clearly that the amount of sales is relatively stable. It's kind of a flat line, except for this weird month in August. Um, so instead of having to look very closely through all of these numbers in this table before you see that this number in August is weird, um, this dip in that line visually stands out as kind of an outlier and weird month. And so the uh, line chart visualizing that is so much more effective than the table um, because people's information or attention um, is limited. Uh, and what we want to do is present information in kind of the most accessible and impactful way. Um, and that's the way that's going to consume the least amount of um, a viewer's conscious attention. So conscious attention is um, forcing our readers or our viewers to focus in on something and then to search for things. So in the table, I was having to focus in and look at and um, process what each one of those numbers meant. And then I was searching across all of the different numbers in that table to understand which numbers were getting bigger. Was there an increase over time? Um, and then for the international sales, I was searching for a month that was weird compared to the other months. Um, but in the chart, it was, requiring much less of that focus and search conscious attention, and it was using um, pre-conscious or what we call pre-attentive uh, attention. So it was things that were popping it out and, and grabbing my attention um, and forcing me to focus in on them um, in just like an easy and effortless way. So things that don't require as much of our conscious attention include like motion, so we can see when things um, are you know moving from one direction to another. Um, color, we can kind of pretty quickly identify um, what's one color versus another, except in the cases of um, you know when we have color blindness. 
Uh, and we can easily understand um, the differences in, in form, in the size or the shape or the length of something. Um, and so we could um, kind of see very quickly that that line chart for the domestic sales was going up. Uh, and then we could very quickly see um, that the, the dip in the international sales. Um, and so that form and 2D position when things are higher or lower to the left or right or something, um, those are things that just immediately pop out and that our brain can immediately identify. And so for trying to address these questions about trends and crime rates, how can we um, visualize something that pulls the viewer's attention to it with a kind of pre-conscious attention rather than requiring this much more taxing conscious attention? Um, but then I also want it to be impactful. I want it to pop and I want the viewer to just kind of be pulled into this visualization. What can I do? Um, well, if I follow some of the um, default visualizations from Excel, or if I look at um, kind of sometimes a lot of visualizations in um, media outlets or blogs or what have you, um, then I can see that there's uh, this kind of very flashy looking, well, I mean, I guess we have different um, classifications for flashy. I'm pretty nerdy, so to me this is a very flashy um, chart. Um, and so we've got this um, kind of flashy looking uh, column chart. It's actually a horizontal bar chart. Uh, over here on this axis, I've got the years of the data. So this is the U.S. in you know 2012, 13, 14. This is the U.S. in 26. Or, sorry, 1960. Uh, and then on this axis, we've got the number of total crimes. Um, so the length of the bar is uh, representing the number of crimes in the U.S. in that year. And um, this, oops. Oh, come on, man. Okay, and this um, chart is trying to grab the viewer's attention um, with a 3D effect. So you can see that in the back of the chart, it's kind of uh, tilted backwards, and then the bars are kind of coming at us. And so it's trying to grab the viewer's attention by having um, bars with more crime come at the viewer and pull our attention to when um, there are periods with high crime. And so when we've got these bars coming at us, our eyes are drawn to this portion right here where there was um, the highest level of the numbers of crimes. Uh, and then we trace that back and we see that this was somewhere around um, the late 80s, around 1990 is when we had this highest level. Um, and it looks like it got bigger from 1960 and then it got smaller um, from this time to 2012. Um, but there are several things about the chart that make it not as effective as it could be. Uh, the first main thing is the fact that this um, 3D tilt effect is actually distorting the visual size of different parts of the chart in order to make it to, to produce this illusion of it coming out of the page. Uh, and so the 3D effect, it makes things that are supposed to look like they're farther away from us smaller than the things, oops, geez. Um, so the 3D effect, uh, it's making things that are supposed to look farther away from us visually smaller than the things that are supposed to look um, like they're coming out at us. Um, those things are, are made to look visually larger. Uh, and so the graph is kind of distorting the fact where all of the things in the back are shrunken relative to all of the things in the front. And so because this part of the graph is supposed to look like it's further away from us, it's being visually distorted to look smaller. And so these uh, bars down here are being shrunken down uh, more than they should compared to the size of the bars up here. And so that kind of for what we call a foreshortening effect, um, where the back bars are smaller than they're supposed to be and the front of the bars are bigger than they're supposed to be, that distance between them makes this growth of crime from 1960 to around 1990 look much bigger than it is. Um, so it looks like there was almost no crime back here and then it you know, quadrupled over the course of time, but it's actually not to scale because of that 3D distortion. Uh, the other limitation of this chart is that because they're trying to make the bars look like they're coming out at you, um, Excel has made them look like they're three-dimensional boxes instead of just a two-dimensional stripe of color. And so the tops of these bars that are dark blue um, to make them look like they're coming out of the page, distort where the end of the bar is. 
So is the end of the bar signaling the amount of crime? Is that at the top part here or is it at this part right here? Um, and then this 3D effect also means that the bars are somehow above these lines of the axis that we're trying to interpret. Uh, and so in an attempt to grab attention, the graph has also visually distorted the scale of the comparison that we're trying to make and made um, the bars representing the crime rates kind of unclear. Uh, so what if I try to fix it a little bit? So one of the other problems here is that um, we've got time down at the bottom of this vertical um, going up to the top here. And so we're trying to think about the progression of crime over the course of time. That means we have to look up instead of um, across. And so if I try to fix that, I think this graph is actually a little bit clearer than the last one. Um, so from the back to the front, I'm moving forward in time now, which feels more intuitive. Uh, and then I'm comparing across um, heights of columns instead of the lengths of bars, which is visually easier for the reader. Um, so again, we're communicating that there was this increase in the crime rate from 1960 to 1990. Um, and then here it looks kind of like it leveled off um, from here to here. But again, we've got this 3D distortion in effect. And so these bars back here are shrunken down, they're distorted to look smaller than they're supposed to be in order to make it look like this chart is coming out of the page as we go forward in time. And so these bars are distorted to look larger than they are, these bars are distorted to look smaller than they should be. And so this increase looks bigger than it probably really is. And this downward trend is kind of compressed and it looks shorter than it's supposed to be. So when we look at this vertical one, it looks like there's a huge increase and then kind of a, a big decrease, but not as um, big as this, this increase here. This one, um, I think, is a little more intuitive because of it, the way it's arranging time and the number of crimes. But that decrease in crime from 1990 looks kind of shrunken down. So um, the way that we're doing uh, the participation points, it's the Canvas questions instead of the clicker questions. Remember, you don't have to get the question correct to get the points. They're just participation points. Um, and so either write down this answer as you're watching, um, like note it down on the printout of the lecture slides, um, or you can just have uh, two Canvas windows open, one with the quiz and one with the lecture. Um, so the previous two graphs have which of the following problems and um, multiple of these uh, options might apply. Um, did they have distracting color combinations? Um, was it that 3D effects distorted the scales of the axis? Was it that the axes were not clearly labeled? Or was it the, the heights of the tilted bars were unclear? Um, well, the color combinations, they were all blue, and then the only time there was anything else that was just a darker blue to make it look 3D, um, but the, the colors were pretty consistent. Um, was it that the 3D effects distorted the scales of the axis? Yeah, it was. Um, things looked artificially small when they were supposed to appear like they were far away, which distorts our comparison. Was it that the axes were not clearly labeled? Um, the axes were actually labeled quite fine, um, and so that's not the problem. Um, was it that the heights of the tilted bars were unclear? Yes, that was a problem. Um, and so the answers would be B and D. All right, so what are some other ways to think about identifying bad visualizations? We just talked through a couple examples, um, but ways to think about it are, is it just kind of aesthetically in poor taste? Um, does it just look ugly to you? Um, is it a kind of a, a bad combination of colors that are just bright and tacky looking, um, that clash with each other? Um, is Do they use weird um, fonts, typefaces? So in the reading for this week in um, the course textbook, there are some examples where um, charts are given titles with kind of stylized fonts that look, um, you know, like they're some kind of a, you know, a graphic design or they're um, kind of a cursive style handwriting um, mimicking font. Um, and those can be distracting because they're just hard to read. Um, what we want is a nice, clear typeface um, where you can read it. And it's not distracting. It's not getting in the way. Um, the meaning is coming through instead of the style of it that you're trying to convey. Um, other typefaces that um, are not great are things like, um, you know, Comic Sans, which looks like it's a kind of a cartoonish um, typeface that, that's just not a great um, or very professional looking way to visualize data. Um, Papyrus is um, a font that I just personally uh, hate. Uh, I mean, I don't know, if you want to use Papyrus, fine, but anytime I walk into a restaurant and the menu is Papyrus, I'm like, oh crap, I'm really in for it now. Um, 
I am. Okay. Anyway, uh, is it cluttered? Uh, do the like the bars on this kind of previous illustration here? Uh, when you look at these gaps here, they're really kind of distracting. Um, it makes the one bar to the next just kind of look cluttered. It looks like there's um, multiple bars in here instead of just supposed to be one bar per year. Um, we're seeing the bar per year and then the alternating colored gaps between them for the 3D effect. Um, that kind of, whoops. Um, so that kind of a clutter is, is very distracting. Um, next, is it bad or unclear data? So that was the biggest problems with these 3D effects here was that the scales um, of the variables were unclear. And so it was hard to see, the perception was bad because of the 3D effect, and because of that 3D effect, we also could not properly interpret the scale. Um, so how would we fix that? How would we convey that same information in a visualization that doesn't suffer from um, some of these visualization problems? What if we just do a simple, clean line chart um, like you used for the Try It for the growth of enrollment um, among California um, or students at the University of California uh, in Davis? So we've got now um, it's similar to that last 3D chart where we've got um, the year on the x axis, the total number of crimes in the United States on the y axis, but instead of using this 3D effect, it's flat. It's just a flat 2D. Um, graph, which means that the scales of it isn't distorted. And uh, instead of columns um, with a 3D effect, we've just got a simple line. So all we've done is connect the tops of the columns together into this line, and then we've removed all of that visual clutter of the individual lines and the gaps between them. And so this very clearly demonstrates um, that crime increased quite a bit from 1960 to 1990. It clearly communicates the scale of that increase and when there were dips. And it communicates that there was a pretty steady decline in crime rates, or I'm sorry, in total numbers of crime from 1990 through um, the late 2000s. And, but that, that decrease wasn't quite as large as the increase that we observed in the earlier era. Um, so this is much better. It's cleaner. It's easier to see um, increase and decrease without visual clutter and without distortion, distortion of scale. Uh, one other adjustment that we can make though, and this is less of a visual adjustment than it is um, kind of being an analyst trying to understand the relevant comparison, we can convert from the total numbers of crimes to the total crime rate. So that adjustment for population size. Uh, so we saw that the population in the United States like almost doubled from uh, 1960 through um, the late kind of uh, 20 teens. And so we need to adjust for the fact that there are so many more people, which means that there are so many um, kind of possible numbers of crimes over the course of time. And so now when we make that adjustment for the fact that the population was really small in the 1960s compared to how large it was um, in recent years, then the comparison actually looks a little bit different. Um, so a lot of that growth in crime from 1960 to the 1990s was um, kind of also moving alongside population growth. And so relative to the population, crime still absolutely increased, but only until about 1980. Uh, and then what we see is kind of a, a little dip um, before 1990, again, the crime rate decreased. But that decrease, um, when we adjust for the fact that not only was the number of crimes going down, but um, the population was increasing, so then the rate was decreasing actually quite a bit more rapidly. And so now um, by the 19 or by the 20 teens, crime is back on a level with where it was in the late 1960s. Um, and so this is the only visualization that very clearly um, demonstrates this sustained decline in crime. Uh, and so putting that into context with um, the prior visualizations, um, these rapid uh, increases in recent years are um, perhaps uh, not uh, an indicator of a sustained trend. There may be more of a blip. All right, so for the second um, Canvas participation question, so why is the crime rate a better measure than the number of crimes when we're comparing over the course of time? Is it because rates are always more accurate than numbers? Um, is it because line graphs are more appropriate for rates um, than they are for numbers? Uh, is it because population growth increased the potential number of crimes? Or is it because the scale of the y-axis was more reasonable when we use rates than numbers? 
Uh, and the answer was C. It was that population growth, um, trying to adjust for the fact that these um, were very different sizes of populations from one year to the next. Um, are rates always more accurate than numbers? No. Um, the rates are calculated based on the numbers, so um, how could a, a rate be more accurate than the numbers that it's coming from? Um, is it because line graphs are more appropriate for rates than numbers? No. Um, both of those line graphs were um, perfectly adequate representations of the data that they were coming from. Um, and is it because the scale of the y-axis is more reasonable when we use um, rates than numbers? No, um, the, the rate was a much smaller number than the um, total numbers of crimes in any given year, but um, that, that has nothing to do with um, a visualization thing. So, all right, we've got our questions that we're returning to. Has crime increased uh, in the U.S. over time? No, it, it has not. Um, so crime was actually decreasing pretty steadily over the last few decades. Uh, and if we think about kind of what that um, growth in violent crime might mean for that long-term trend, um, given how much crime went down from 1990, the amount that crime has increased very recently is kind of like a very small blip. It's like a tiny little ski jump at the end of that very long decline from 1990. And the other thing that we're noticing is that those data come from the nation as a whole. So the New York Times was representing data just for places where crime increased, leaving out all the places where crime decreased. So we have to think about how representative of um, the population are the data. And if the New York Times is only picking places where crime increased, it's not representing all of the places where crime didn't increase. Um, and that's what these data do. These data in include pretty much the entire nation, and when we're doing that, we're not trying to focus in on just high crime places. Um, we're not seeing such a dramatic increase, and we're actually seeing that crime has been steadily declining over the course of time. Uh, so in the next segment, we'll turn to what about violent crime? So has violent crime increased over the course of time?